So thanks for thanks yeah, for coming thanks. out and listening to me. Um, and um, um, I can I can make it very interactive. So um, I I wasn't one hundred percent sure how much time I got uh, with you. So it turns out thirty minutes. So that's just going to be enough um, that uh, I'm going to probably focus on the sexy stuff. So I'm going to just start <laughs> with the with the cases right away instead of providing. Usually I lead off with a little bit of background, with a little theoretical and, and explanatory stuff. But if I have half an hour, we'll just jump right in. And uh, I'm not going to monitor the chat because I can't chew gum and walk at the same time. Uh, so I'm just going to focus on that thing. So uh, feel free to interrupt me at any old time. If you can't hear my thick New Jersey accent, um, then... Uh, kidding i'm from germany so um so uh, just uh, just just bring it to my attention or if something is uh, too weird or you have a question um i'm you know obviously used to lecture to a lot of students and when i see uh faces when i look into 20 faces that have frowned eyebrows i know that i lost my audience somehow i'm happy to uh backtrack so here with the zoom thing it's not that super obvious because i can't see the vast majority of you but anyhow um what I think we're going to do, we jump right in and we'll start with a couple of cases that we treated here at University of Georgia. Um, this is where I'm a professor in exotic animal medicine and uh, I have been embracing um, the apiary, apiary world uh, from a professional point of view uh, for a while. Privately, I've been a beekeeper for about 20 years. Um, so, um, um, you know, whatever, I, I just probably, if that would be karate, I'd have a, probably a yellow belt, I guess, after 20 years, you just, just started, uh, the entry level. So yeah, I'm looking forward to another 40 years of learning beekeeping. So anyhow, um, um, let's start with this. I, before I'll start with these cases, I just want to have this slide up as a as a clarification that you don't think I'm this mad scientist. Um, well, maybe I am, but um, I want to put it in uh, correlation that I'm not completely mad. So basically, all these cases that I'm going to show to you, they they all had a very significant pathology, and they're all basically cancer patients now, and um, and so basically. Um, I just see that I spelled treatment wrong. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> need to fix that one. Um, so it's basically these cases are all um, fairly, fairly poor prognosis. And after I consulted with our oncology department, um, they basically just looked at me and um, gave me the sad puppy eyes and said, you know, there's not much in Western medicine that we can do because none of these cases probably responds well to radiation oncology and or um, on the shelf uh, chemotherapy agents. So, so when I talked to the owners about this, I said, look, I got bad news. Um, you know, our oncologists are really negative about this. And uh, if you're willing to give this a try, which is all, you know, very experimental, um, I'll talk you through uh, the options that we have with AP therapy. And, and you know, most of the time, people were very um, kind of like uh, realistic with it and said, well, what are we going to do? Just euthanize? I'm like, yeah, exactly. That would have been the other option, humane euthanasia. So the vast majority of the people, obviously, I didn't really have to arm wrestle in it or convince or something like this. We just had a nice talk and... Um, you know, and I, I made sure that they understand this is kind of an experimental uh, a therapy and that uh, we, are, we are learning while we're doing it. So I just want to throw this out um, that I'm not, you know, that there's no misunderstanding. So this is definitely not something that is standard treatment that we are. This is all very, very uh, new stuff. And, and hopefully there's a little bit exciting stuff for you. So anyway, so let's start with the first one. So this is a, this is a guinea pig. Uh, called um, not make very cute little guinea pig and as you can see one side is not hey, like Dr. the other Mayor, there your yep. screen isn't sharing if you could share your screen everybody would be able to see it oh my gosh thanks you for bringing this to my Absolutely. attention so i've been talking for myself and i've had all this let me see screen sharing it's a german confidence don't worry about it 
Oh, I'm sorry, man. I, I'm just like, I should, I should know this by now, but where's that little menu bar? I don't see that little Zoom menu. Usually I have a little bar. Let me see. Where can I zoom? Share screen. There we go. Um, it's disabled. I can. So you need right. to somehow um, enable me. All right. Make there and do this. How about now? That's okay. that Marine Corps confidence. There you All go. All right, let's ah. see. Let's see. Oh, beautiful. Okay, you gave me permission. Uh, boom, share. Are you Perfect. seeing nutmeg? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, cool. All right, here's our little nutmeg. And like I said, uh, one side does not look like the other. So, um, and just uh, backing up a little bit, um, I just noticed, uh, uh, yeah, so... This animal was actually presented or the owner called me and I said, listen, you know, it's like I have a sick guinea pig. The, um, the, the local veterinarian actually moved in there and actually did surgery and removed that mass and sent it out to the pathologist. And uh, and within a couple of weeks, it started to regrow uh, because they didn't get uh, all of it, which once you hear the nature of that tumor, it's very obvious. It's surgeries close to impossible um to uh, to get you know rid of all this stuff so i usually compare these kind of nasty tumors that are set very infiltrative kind of like two weeds in your garden right yeah you can maybe pluck them out but guess what two weeks the johnson grass is back again right because the roots are just too far deep in the soil um so this is very similar with these kind of tumors you 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 kind of just you know removing that bulge that you see there is basically just you know you going out in the garden and pulling the top weed but there's so many on often on a microscopic level uh cancer cells that go deep down and as you can see from the location this is obviously um, a, a very critical location. It's basically where a lot of structures, the big names are, the carotid artery, right, esophagus, the trach. So it's very infiltrative around the neck. Um, and so you can't be super radical. Um, uh, just to give you an example, if this would be a mass that would be maybe on the shoulder, on the elbow, um, you know, an, 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 a treatment for this would be probably limb amputation that you would take the whole leg off. So obviously this is not an option here. So anyway, so they tried as best as they could. Um, unfortunately, the mass regrew. They did a second surgery, maybe um, because I wasn't in the room, but I assume that they were a little bit more aggressive uh, in that second surgery. And then basically it grew back again, right? It reared its ugly head again. And at that point, uh, the owner contacted me and says, hey, Dr. Meyer, is there anything on your shelf that you've got? So um, I said, let me think about it. Give me that report. And that's that report. It's a well differentiated spindle cell sarcoma. So as some of you probably know, every time a tumor ends in sarcoma, it's really bad news for you, right? So um, uh, that is basically the equivalent of the weed. A sarcoma uh, is very infiltrative. And then differentiated spindle cell, that, that's bad news. That's bad news too. So so again, the fact that it's incompletely excised has absolutely nothing to do with the skill of the surgeon. Um, that is just more or less impossible to do. So as I said in the intro, I, I took that piece of paper, ran to our oncologist's and said, you know, what, what do you got for me? And they just, they just, you know, shook their head and said, we, we don't really have anything for it. This is nasty radical excision, and and it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, respond to radiation. I'm like, okay. Um, so, and this is how, um, you know, then I went back to the owner and talked to them about it. So, um, looking through the literature, I found actually interesting that report, and and that's a very similar case. So this is obviously human medicine, and it's from from China. And this is a report where you had a liposarcoma. Again, notice it ends with a sarcoma, so it's a nasty, nasty tumor of the fat cells. So the fatty tissue gets cancerous, and so you could have potentially a lipoma, which is also a cancer of the fat cells. But that is a benign one so that could be easily excised but um, this one unfortunately is not a lipoma it's a liposarcoma meaning it's very infiltrative um, so in this situation in this human as you see the patient had attained a maximum dose of radiation so it was already treated with radiation and just like as our oncologist um, predicted said like look this is not a great treatment regime for that and 
And the difference um, <clears throat> to radiation therapy versus uh, uh, medical oncology is if you get chemotherapy uh, and, uh, you know, the tumor is kind of like retreating and you're actually free of clinical signs and disease, that's called you in remission, right? And so, so a, lot of, a lot of cancers uh, potentially go actually fairly easy in remission with chemotherapy only to raise the ugly head. At a, at a later time, right? So this is why people that have been treated with chemotherapy, that's why they need to go frequently back to recheck to see if they're still considered in remission or if it, if it comes back. And so again, um, the problem with radiation is that a chemotherapy treatment can always be repeated. Let's say you were treated for something like lymphoma, you get IV chemotherapy, uh, and you're doing really well. And after three years, the lymphoma decides to come back. Well, you can repeat that chemotherapy and hopefully you'll, you'll put that uh, lymphoma into remission again. Um, unfortunately, with radiation therapy, radiation is for life. So if you're getting a dose and then let's say you're in remission for 20 or 30 years, um, you cannot get another radiation dose. So even though this is 30 years later, your body has been radiation poisoned. Um, and that's the maximum dose. If you would give more radiation, then you would cause cancer with this. So, so that was already off the table for that human in that case report. And as you see, basically, it was resistant to what we, what we call multidrug resistant chemotherapy. So it was infiltrating now the heart, the lungs, and the diaphragm. So obviously big names. So um, at that point, right, you're grasping a little bit at straws. And so basically, at that point, um, they picked AP therapy, all right? Uh, uh, so basically, they gave B venom into acupuncture points. And so this is a lot of times where when we leave Western medicine, when we go Eastern uh, or, uh, you know, kind of complementary medicine, so acupuncture comes in handy. And so what they're doing is that they're basically applying the B venom at acupuncture meridians. Um, and so basically, they gave that, um, they gave the B stings. And then as you see the bottom, the patient was able to fully undergo radical liposarcoma resection and no evidence of recurrence was found 16 months after surgery. So the, the, the B venom was able to shrink that sarcoma to a point where then eventually the surgeon felt comfortable. And you know what? I think now we can go in, you know, in the situation because a lot of those roots of the cancer are basically nipped by the by the AP therapy, by the venom. And now all we need to do is take that big swelling out, that big main tumor. And and so that that paper encouraged me um, to try that. And a guinea pig, I said, well, if it's good for a human, you know, it's good enough for me. So here's a little, here's a little graph. So basically this is again from that paper. So that you see how that uh, how that person was diagnosed in February 2000, and then he got actually 80 gray of radiation. If you know anything about um, about radiation, you know this is a wicked high dose. So um, if you would get a full body dose of radiation with 80 gray, you would be dead within a couple of days. So, so however, if we target a specific organ, and this was a liposarcoma, this was probably close to, you know, the lungs because it was spreading towards the heart, the lungs, the diaphragm. So it was probably in that chest area. Uh, uh, and um, the heart is unfortunately an organ that once it's damaged, it doesn't recuperate really well, right? I mean, so today you could potentially cut 40, 50% of my liver out. And, uh, you know, in a couple of years, you wouldn't even know because the liver completely regenerates, right? Unfortunately, the heart, the lungs, they don't regenerate. So, and this is, you know, once you have a stroke or a cardiac, uh, you know, pathology, then the heart never can really repair to it to the previous state. And so this is why the heart and the lung, they were probably in that field of radiation. And like I said, even if you would be in remission for 20 years, you can never go back to get more. Uh, and obviously, as you see, at five surgeries, 11 round of chemotherapy. So that person was treated very well from an oncology point of view, and yet the tumor came back. At that point, the green bar helped the starts. As you see, 
initially, like, and that was, as you see, 19 years after the first diagnosis. The first diagnosis was in 2000, and then they managed them, you know, for close to 20 years, and it came back. Um, and so you see, initially, they started with 18 bee stings, uh, because you kind of want to approach that a little bit careful, um, not to cause, obviously, anaphylaxis, or you overwhelm the body. But then, as you see, it has been escalated up to 50 bee stings each time. So think about it. That's a, that's a hefty dose, right? Um, and then then the patient eventually had that radical surgery in October. So they started the AP therapy in May, treated them until October, and then did that radical surgery. And then, um, you know, the patient was considered more or less cured. So that, that's the timeline that we have here. So very interesting from that point of view. Uh, all right, so here's our case. So anyway, so we have teaching apiary at the hospital. So I went out and, um, you know, collected a couple of bees there in, in our red top tube. Um, and, um, and so here's our patient. Um, so we do sedate the patient heavily with a drug very similar to Valium, so which I like a lot because, you know, it takes the fear away. It puts them a little bit in la-la land. Um, and then we gave them also topical lidocaine so they don't even feel the sting. And so I just basically let the bee walk up in that red top tube. And in that picture, you actually see the abdomen of the bees touching the skin there. Here's the head. Um, and boom, uh, we have we have contact with the stinger and you have a little bit of a swelling there. And you see the stinger right in there. Um, and like I said, the animal is sedate. As you see, there's not no sign of panic or whatever. And um, I usually leave the stinger in for a good 10, 15 seconds. As you know, the muscles around the venom sac actually keep injecting um, that venom. So I want to make sure that we have uh, the full dose of venom in there. I remove the stinger, make sure I got everything. And then I throw it in the shops container that nobody gets injured. Um, this we did a couple of times, and this is our nutmeg three months later. Again, remember that uh, initially it had surgery, and a couple of weeks later it regrew and it had a second surgery, right? And it wanted to regrow. So I was extremely happy, you know, that we're already going for three months and uh, and nutmeg is looking good. The owner said, Oh my god, you know, that guinea pig you would never know it had uh, disease. Um, it's running with the herd and uh, having a good time and eating, gaining body weight. After five months, it signed a contract as a photo model. So yeah, there we go. That's a that's a good looking and look how chubby our little nutmeg is. So it's clearly not wasting away here. So quality of life, and to be honest, to me that's the most important thing. You know, I, I really focus on quality of life. Um, I'm not a huge fan of doing too many experimental surgeries or whatever. If you know, you can't take half of the face off if that would be, but I'm like, you know, is this really what my patient wanted? So I was extremely happy five months later. Well, here's where I did my first mistake because I already did a happy dance five months later and, you know, said, well, we nipped it in the butt. Well, there we go. The swelling came back, right? And um, so I was, well, you know, the swelling came back. We did quite a few bee stings in there. So I didn't know is that, the swelling now is that the same problem or is there something else it could have easily been like a bacterial abscess maybe um, it could have been maybe a granuloma or a, a, an abscess in the salivary gland or scar tissue or so, so i just had to re-biopsy to make sure that um, you know we're not guessing that the tumor is coming back that we know it's coming back and and here we go, spindle cell sarcoma again. So at least I knew, uh, unfortunately, it's the same thing raising its ugly head again. So um, like I said, hindsight is twenty twenty. If I would, um, you know, if I would have to repeat that, if I could undo time, I would have probably not stopped with my AP therapy while the animal was doing well before the swelling stuff. I would have just continued the animal. But anyway, here we are, seven months later. I still think it's a huge success considering that a couple of weeks after the surgery, it always popped back. So that was already good news. Uh, anyway, so we started to escalate it again. Uh, you know, so here's our little suture from the biopsy. So we knew it is. And um, I got I got my queens. I got Kona queens from Hawaii. And man, they're the gentlest bees. And, you know, I mean, if you've worked with them, you know that they're so. And that bee, as you saw, really has no interest harming my little guinea pig. So... So a lot of times we had to actually grab it with tweezers 
um, and and really apply the the B to it in order to get it to sting. So I got good girls. So because I was scared that this was coming back, so I was like, you know what? Uh, let's escalate it up. So I'm going to not only do I do the venom, but I'm also going to use honey. So I use my own honey, which I know is unadulterated and I know it's not contaminated with some chemicals from any kind of, so I know it's good quality honey. And um, I came across this pa a paper where it actually uh, showed um, the use of IV. And as you see here, there's the syringe driver and you see our syringe up there, a little bit yellow. That is the honey a little bit diluted with saline going right IV. And there you see a little nutmeg. And that's the only side effect that I've ever seen is it gives them the munchies. So they are really, really not caring about what I'm doing. As you see, they are just happy and eating. And so basically what happened, we went actually to weekly injections um, uh, for honey and uh, venom, the bee venom. And we really were able to shrink this tumor into a small little pea-sized mass, very similar to that paper that I told you about, uh, where then the surgeons were able to move in and cut it out. However, at that point, the owner was kind of a look dog, you know, what is the likelihood of we doing a th third surgery um, and it's cured? I'm like, well, to be honest, I don't know, but there could be a, a likelihood that, that we're going to repeat that same thing. We're going to cut something out and just going to grow back. Because the animal was doing so well at the time from a quality of life point of view and... Uh, and the owner said, you know what, why don't we just do monthly maintenance therapy? I'm happy to bring that guinea pig back. We do it just monthly. I know it's not a cure, but, and to be honest, guinea pigs don't make great surgical candidates. So there's a huge anesthesia risk with it. Guinea pig just use any excuse to die. So, um, and, and I'm like, yeah, I, I get you. You know, that, that a third surgery would be a little bit risky. So if you're okay with the fact that we're going to have to do maintenance, then fine with me. And and so that's what was decided. And so this is, again, uh, several months later. So you see the swelling is coming back. That's why we have been a little bit more aggressive. So then I came across this paper, too, where they look at just honey, um, honey and this rolling cancer. Um, and again, one thing that I'm talking a little bit in my intro is like that the culture of AP therapy um, one of some of the earliest records that we know about AP therapy actually comes from the old Sumerian, right? I mean, that's that's uh, by some definition is obviously an intellectual debate. It's like when does civilization start? At what time do you say this is civilization? And so, some consensus about scholars is that you know once you have a written culture that you have a writing um the earliest writing this is when we think that um, that this would be the start of civilization and and it goes back to the old sumerians obviously you know uh what is now iran iraq uh, uh mesopotamia persia whatever you want to call it right that's kind of like a cradle of civilization what we think of and you can truly find in old sumerian writings um uh, references to ap therapy so uh, obviously, not surprisingly, um, the idea of AP therapy is much deeper ingrained in the socioeconomic uh, 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 aspect in that society. So um, some of you might have seen, um, you know, hospitals uh, in the Middle East that actually really focus on AP therapy. Um, in other countries like Brazil, actually, um, AP therapy is considered standard of care. So you have you have real, you know, real well-functioning Western medicine uh, functioning uh, uh, hospitals that definitely embrace AP therapy because they see so many good things. So a lot of these papers come from that neck of the world. And so is this one. And, and one of the things that I found interesting, and here's from that paper, you see what, again, the the where they, these papers originated, a lot of the Middle East, obviously, yes, there's one paper from USA, one Brazil, one Japan. And so these papers, uh, so this one is actually a summary of just oral, oral effects of honey anti-cancer. And so what's really interesting is that, yes, so for example, cisplatin is a chemotherapy that is used a lot. And unfortunately, as you know, all of these drugs come with side effects, right? And some of the side effects of cisplatin actually that it can induce kidney failure. And so interesting what they did with the mice, they actually gave um, 
uh, when they had cisplatin given to them, they also gave honey orally and it actually protected them against that renal failure that is induced by. So, so again, there's lots of good evidence out there, um, you know, control of cancer related complications for, uh, you know, all that stuff. So that is so, so if you, if you have only one thing that you're going to take home from this talk tonight, eat your honey eat your tablespoon of honey because it keeps the cancer away. So um, you're probably doing all of that anyway, but uh, I mean, it's a good reminder. It's now it's peer reviewed, you see it. So it's, it's good stuff. Um, so this is this is nutmeg. Now we're talking 14 months, you know, and look, this is the owner, obviously only the best, got out and got some manuka honey. And it's like, hey, nutmeg, nom, 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 nom. And initially I told them, you know what? I want you to start with maybe 0.1 milliliter uh, and look at him, he's biting the serum. She's not even letting go. And then he did it twice a day. And uh, and the owner the owner saw that nutmeg loved this so much. So he actually escalated up to one milliliter twice a day, which probably would be the equivalent of me downing probably 14 ounces of, of a honey jar twice a day. So anyway, no side effects, seem, no diarrhea, uh, nothing, no crazy blood glucose levels, whatever. So now we're talking 14 months i mean that is that is pretty cool in my book right um and so unfortunately 16 months later uh the, the tumor grew a little bit it was interfering a little bit with with him taking food in because there was a swelling and so he went to the referring veterinarian to have a debulking surgery done and unfortunately at that point nutmeg didn't recover from anesthesia so that was really sad. Um, however, the owner said that, you know, until the, until that surgery, the day off, I mean, nutmeg had a great quality of life. Um, it was just anatomically now interfering a little bit with it. So this is why he decided to try to have it uh, cut again. And unfortunately, um, you know, guinea pig didn't make it, but I was able to convince the owner to to not bury the body at home, but let us do, um, you know, an autopsy on it, which we call a necropsy. And because, to be honest, I was really interested, especially with these IV honey infusions, are we causing any kind of side effects, right? Are we potentially actually contributing to something like a liver failure? Or are we shooting out the kidneys or something like this? And, um, and absolutely nothing. So obviously the diagnosis, what I found is like, as a soft tissue sarcoma and like look it's interesting remember that human case was a liposarcoma now they felt comfortable that's also liposarcoma i'm like wow what a coincidence um, um the uterus had a little bit of hyperplasia that is extremely common in older female guinea pigs that's normal and then the pancreas is a little bit hyperplastic but that's not cancer that's just a well-functioning pancreas and then you have the lung and the liver and and the kidney too they just had a little bit congestion that means there's a lot of blood in there nothing bad at all so i was really really excited to show with that necropsy that i didn't make anything worse right that i didn't cause like a liver to stop functioning that i didn't cause a kidney problem anyway so that really emboldens me to continue with with aggressive treatment like this for future cases so, um, and yes, yeah, so like I said, this was a liposarcoma, that was a liposarcoma, so it's just kind of like interesting. Um, do we have any questions regarding that case? Is anybody, is anybody confused or excited about it or what's going on? I just wanted to add, add, add a couple things. Of course, you're here at uh, Hives for Heroes and we bring a lot of different types of people in here. This is extremely interesting. Awesome, oh, thank cool. you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. York from uh, UGA, University of Georgia. That was incredible. What got you to actually put those pieces together? I know we have other questions and I know we have a second case as well, but just real quickly, what got you to connect those dots? Um, um, let me, um, when you, when you say, um, what got me, what got me excited about AP therapy in general or about like, what, like, uh, can you can you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, that's good. What, what got you started in it in general? Because I know there's people on this call that oh, one actually do apotherapy even on themselves, 
um, on this call. So what got you interested in that? Because bees are, of course, naturally healing, right? Where there's a lot of healing benefits inside of that medicinal properties and inside of by byproducts and the bees themselves. But what got you interested in that and utilizing that in order to, you know, heal your patients? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for clarification. So yeah, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, I have to go back to that introduction slide actually a little bit. So it's kind of like, um, it, 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 it got me, this stuff gets me excited when I feel like as a clinician, I'm, I'm with the back against the wall, right? I'm like, like, that's why I had that initial intro that like, please don't think I'm a completely crazy scientist that just like throws random stuff at, at my patients. It's literally those cases where Western medicine leaves us alone, right? So where these oncologists said, yeah, you know what, we got nothing on our shelf uh, that we, we can't really help you. And, um, you know, I'm kind of like, okay, I, you know, these animals, they seem to be otherwise enjoying life. Yes, they have cancer that potentially will consume them. And, and eventually we have to consider humane euthanasia. But what do we have to lose when we, when we, when we give that a try? And, uh, and so that kind of gets me excited because to be honest, in my book, this is a low stakes situation, right? It's, it's not that that I'm in a situation where I have four different really good chemotherapeutic agents and the owner is just against it because they hate pharmaceutical industry. And they say, well, no, I want to do homeopathic stuff or whatever. I'm like, I, you know, I would probably try to convince them. It's like, look, I'm a, I'm a fan of homeopathy myself and I'm a fan of this, but trust me, let's go with the hardcore chemotherapy drugs because, and in these kind of cases, you know, where literally option B would have been humane euthanasia, um, that's where I'm kind of like, you know what, there's a lot of evidence in the literature. And again, I obviously didn't cover that a little bit in the introduction because of the time restraint. But but I'm like, look, there's a lot of evidence that when you put cancer cells in a Petri dish and you expose them to bee venom or you expose them to this and this, they all die. And the normal cells in between the cancer cells actually survive. And, and uh, would you be willing to basically do this? And so there is, you know, in medicine, there's two different things. There's something what we call bench top research, which is literally kind of like you take some cells, you put them in a Petri dish, or you do some basic, very basic fundamental kind of research. How does that cell react to that? And, and then there's clinical research. And that's where my heart is. I, I'm, I consider myself much more a clinical researcher, where I have a clinical patient, we have a real problem that we need to solve. And there's currently uh, no book chapters written on that. So that, that gets you down to that experimental route a little bit. And you got to really think about side effects, about a negative potential, you know, because each of these patients, they could potentially have an anaphylaxis and die on the spot. So, so we have all these conversations with the owner. But again, the owner is like, well, Dr. Meyer, like, you know, if he dies, then um, that was the euthanasia that we that we wanted to, right? So that's what kind of gets me going with these cases. We have another question here from Nick says, awesome presentation. What Thank property you. of honey works to stop the poison effect from chemotherapy? Um, wow, I think I think if I would be able to answer this, I should I should nominate myself for the next Nobel Prize in medicine. <laughs> um, so the and 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 so again, I'll talk a little bit in the introduction. So um, one of the issues where um, uh, we have so much evidence, we have so much good scientific evidence about these antineoplastic effects, you know, these all those different antiviral effects, antibacterial, anti antifungal. I mean, if you if you hear me talk you think I'm like one of those snake oil salesmen because they're like, wait a second, it, it can't be that good. And I'm like, well, hey, give me two minutes. I'll show you a, a number of peer-reviewed publications where they show it truly has antiviral activity. Give me another five minutes. I'll show you a couple of papers where there's antifungal activity. Give me another five minutes and there's antibacterial. So the problem is that in in traditional research settings, when you have hardcore researchers, right? They wanna, they, just like you just did, you ask me this question, it's like, well, what is the anti-neoplastic, anti-cancer effect of honey, right? And you wanna 
those researchers want a very defined answer. They want to say, look, this protein in the honey or this substance in the honey is doing this. Therefore, you know, we can explain it. The problem with all these AP therapy products is that you're literally injecting a cocktail of bioactive substances. There's proteins in there, there's amines in there, there's phospholipases in there. So instead of, instead of, my, my analogy that I always use is kind of like, you can go, if you're into classical music, um, you can go to a beautiful evening concert of Yo-Yo Ma or whatever. That is probably the best cello player in the world. The ticket will probably is going to set you back a couple hundred dollars. And it's going to be a beautiful evening listening to his cello concerto. And, you know, two hours cello concerto. Somebody could ask you, how did you like this? You can say, this was the most fantastic evening, right? And then there's a symphony orchestra, right? Where, yeah, the cello is part of it, but you also have the guy in the back with his little triangle that goes bing, bing, right? And then you have the guy in the drums, you got a guy in the piano, you got a, and they all together create this incredible, incredible experience of a classical piece, right? If you would come out of a concert like this and somebody would ask you, what did you like best? Did you like the guy on the drums the best? Did you guys, did you like the piano guy the best? Did you like the, what do you think? What, what guy did you, did you enjoy the best? You'd be like, I, I can't. It was just that whole experience. And so that's how I look at like at these AP therapy products, because you're not injecting one chemotherapeutic agent like, like cisplatin or doxorubicin, right? If I inject doxorubicin five times into a mouse and 30% of these mice die of cardiac failure, I kind of like have a good idea that probably the doxorubicin is cardiotoxic, you know, or cisplatin is nephrotoxic because I'm shooting the kidney out. But if I'm injecting 15 chemotherapeutic agent and 40% dies of renal failure or cardiac failure, you know, can you understand now that I would have a problem pointing a finger at which of those substances it is? And that's exactly the problem that we have with AP therapy products. And this is one of my therapy why it just doesn't get embraced by, you know, real scientists in quotes, because they just say, yeah, this is, this is still snake oil to me, because you can't explain it to me how it works. Yeah, there's a lot of things in this organization can't explain either. And Stims says one of it, just being around bees and hearing the feeling buzzing and calmness, right? Their anxiety and the depression. Yes. Right. This yes. frequency, right? Um, we have Alden, who's our Georgia state leader, who says that his uh, medicinal honey gauzes were used on his grandmother's leg. Three months later, the antibacterial resistant infection had cleared. I know. Um, so there's a lot of this anecdotal information that's on here inside of the chat. So I'm just giving you an update, but people are really loving what you're talking about. Stim says you are a real scientist. Which oh, awesome. Thank you. Experimenting. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you continue and then we'll give our giveaway right after this. Okay. We still have a little bit of time. All yes, righty. Cool. Let me, let me continue with this. Uh, oh no, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Jeez. You would think I would have figured that out by now. Uh, share screen, click on the right one, you dodo. Uh, where's my, where's my screen? What the hell just happened? Okay, there we go. And, uh, let me see, what the, what? So the while screen? he's trying to uh, share that yep. screen, to come up as well. Um, awesome things. It's already 745, so we're going to do our giveaways. Um, we have two giveaways today. Again, $100 gift cards to the place of your choice that will be done um, through our support at Hives for Heroes and through Neela. So one is Frank Cooper. Frank, thank you for being here tonight. Um, that's $100 So whatever's in your local area. Again, what we're trying to do is promote small business and get you the things that you need for showing up, right? 90% 80, 80 of life is showing up, right? And then we have Brenda's iPhone. So you will be getting a... Um, a a message um, from one of our, from Neela. She'll be uh, sending you the message of Frank Cooper and Brenda's iPhone. Congratulations. And back to the show. Thank you guys very much. You are doing a great job. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, all right, let's go with the second case. Uh, that should go a little bit quicker. So um, this was a, a 40, 
year old, 40 something year old um, Amazon parrot. Uh, obviously, every time when you have a 40 year old pet in your household, it's kind of like a family member, right? The owner really wanted to do everything. Um, and so the complaint was obviously the bird wasn't doing too hot. Um, and every time when it pooped or peed, there was frank blood uh, in it. So obviously um, the owner noticed that's abnormal. So we went into the cloaca, we biopsied it, and it came back, adenocarcinoma. Again, pattern recognition here for you guys ends with the carcinoma again. Bad news here. Um, the way to really deal with those things would be radical resection. So again, uh, as an example, if you would have uh, an adenocarcinoma on your leg, um, the doctors would probably recommend leg amputation, right? So radical surgery, and then they would probably still follow up with, with chemotherapy on top of it. So unfortunately, because this was inside the cloaca, um, and the cloaca is obviously an opening where all three, uh, um, you know, holes end into one. So basically your, your, your waste product from the kidneys end in the cloaca, uh, your reproductive opening uh, ends in the cloaca, and then your GI oh, tract uh, ends into in the cloaca. So unfortunately, um, you know, in human medicine, when you have colon cancer, you can obviously cut the piece of the colon out and... And, um, and that would work. And you have an artificial, um, you know, stoma created uh, and you have a colostomy. But unfortunately, if you have a cloaca, that's not an option because three openings end in there. So, so radical surgery, again, wasn't an option. Um, so this is a CT scan. So it gives you kind of like a, a cross section and the white stuff in the back here. I don't know. Can you guys see my pointer, my, my mouse pointer? Can you guys see that? Or is it just me that sees it? We can see it. Okay, cool. So as you see the white stuff, this is contrast material in the cloaca and where it's not white, this is basically a filling defect of the cancer. So you can see the cancer is filling part of the cloaca and up there you see this is the kidney that obviously end product ends in the cloaca. There's the GI tract ending in it and you obviously, if it's a male bird, you have a testis or a, a female would have ovary and then that would end in the cloaca too. So that gives you the idea why surgery is not an option. So this is what it looked like endoscopically. So we stick a little camera into the cloaca, we infuse it with a little bit saline, and you see the cloaca in there. And you see how it looks a little bit cauliflower-like, and that's the cancer. Usually a cloaca should be very smooth, and there shouldn't be any kind of like the, these warty-like protrusion. This is all the cancer. So and this is how we got to the diagnosis. So because blood was coming, you know, basically with feces, with urine so we probably thought there was something in the cloaca stuck that camera in took a little piece and again that tip the tip of that grabber there is probably the same size than a ball pen tip so don't don't freak out you know it's it's a it's 10 times more than 10 times magnification so here you see us grabbing that piece and then basically just ripping that little piece out but that's what we need in order to get a diagnosis going here so here you see it about and now it's getting pale because it's getting bleached from that pressure so the 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 blood leaves that area and then you see we ripped it out and then you see one or two drops of blood coming out right there but not a big deal so it's kind of like a little scab um, but that's the only way you diagnose it again i want you to remember how red this whole area is that means it's inflamed cancer brings a lot of blood to it it's it's basically nasty um, so here's our, here's our, um, then in, because I can't shove a bee up the cloaca, I thought, well, all right, we'll put it really close to it. So you see the opening of the cloaca down there. So, and then I thought, well, we'll just give it into the area of the cloaca. And here you see, we grab that um, bee with forceps and then we leave that stinger in there for 10, 15 seconds. Um, because like I said, the traditional method didn't work with my friendly bees anymore. They just go and walk right back. They're just too nice, my bees. Um, so anyway, so this is actually after two injections, that's a couple of weeks later. Can you already see how that tissue is bleached, how it's significantly less red? That means the bee venom is doing its job. It's basically shutting that cancer factory down. And if, um, you know, if it's not 
super supplied with blood anymore, it's getting bleached. And obviously the cancer didn't go away. You still see that cauliflower like thing. Yeah, it's not going to erase it. But as you can see, it's it's white. There is not a lot of blood going into. So it literally puts that growth of the tumor to a standstill. So the only side effect that I saw after a couple of injections was a little white, kind of like a like a little bubble there, but it wasn't pus, it wasn't infected. It was just tissue. Again, here it was bleached where a little bit of the venom was um, was uh, applied there. So that was the side effect. Unfortunately, the owner did the biggest cardinal mistake that I warned him not to do, but you know, they don't listen to you. So um, the owner said, this bird is doing so well, I'm not coming back. And I'm like, no, don't do that because we are not doing chemotherapy. We are not really destroying the tumor. What we're we doing, we're putting this tumor on notice. It's not growing. She didn't want to hear anything about it. She stopped it. And here you see the blood. So she came back once there was blood again. And so she said, well, I want to keep going with this. And I'm like, no. Um, all right, we'll try again. Unfortunately, um, that bird didn't recover from sedation. So unfortunately, the owner didn't want to do a necropsy. So I'm really upset at that because I, again, I wanted to see if there was anything else going on. From that initial CT, we know that the cancer was probably already in the kidney because this one kidney was significantly bigger than the other one. So I'm just worried that waiting two months um, after the, you know, after the bird has been doing well, just advanced the tumor further on and potentially wreaked havoc there. So I wish they would have continued. A quick third one. Do we have time for a third one or should we call it quits here? Um, let's see. We have um, a one hour time limit. How quick can you go? <laughs> um, I can go fairly quick. About your time limit, Steve. I can go, but the other thing is like, is there any official business? You could you could do the official business, and if people want to, you know, say hasta luego, and then the the only the people that want to hang in for the third case can hang out. So I don't want to hold up the whole meeting. That is perfectly good. Thank you very much for that opportunity, um, everybody. Dr. Mayer from the University of Georgia. Um, as y'all know, we go into kind of our regionals, right? So we're going to go West Coast, East Coast, et cetera, and just try to see what's going on in your areas in beekeeping. Obviously, we just had an eclipse as well. That's probably been on everybody's mind. Um, seems like the general consensus is bees were calm. Awesome. Um, if y'all have any experiences there, but what I'd like to do is go uh, West Coast, especially because we have um, Alberta on the call now. Alberta, you got the event coming up in May. Let us know what's going on in California. Okay. Um, we have May 4th, uh, kind of close to where you're on a bee in Woodland, California, the California Honey Festival. Um, There's expecting, I guess, like 40,000 people. So it should be a good event. So maybe if anybody wants to plan a trip out to wine country or Southern Cal uh, Northern California, come on out. Hopefully I'll get to see you, Steve. Maybe you can spend some time or come down a little bit. Uh, also, World Bee Day in San Diego on, I think, May 19th. And um, I'll be um, doing a couple of local events on Costa Mesa Earth Day on April 20th. And then uh, there's a company called um, Bar Gin, and they're promoting uh, honey gins this uh, month. And uh, it's an event with one of my local bee clubs, and they're allowing me to have a table there. So um, that's what's happening in Southern California. Finally, we might not get as much rain. Still rain forecasted for Friday, but hopefully that will be the end of it. Yeah, California's <laughs> booming, and we hope to get out there. That's that's pretty incredible. And there's so much stuff going on mm -hmm. out in your areas. It's yeah. really all over the state. And of course, it's spring. Yeah. But there's a lot of in influence and um, interest in the general public too. So, as you're a beekeeper, yeah. you know, share that knowledge and experience of of what you've learned. Um, you know a lot more than you think you do. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move over to let's see. Is Ralph Kettle? He's in Colorado. Um, are you on, Ralph? Scott Steele. Scott Tanner. So, well, hit the wrong button. There we go. So, <laughs> hey, in, so Scott Steele is our Louisiana state leader. Go ahead. 
Uh, we got the, uh, this coming Friday, we got the Louisiana Beekeeper Association Spring Field Day coming up. Um, should be a pretty decent event. Hopefully so. Privet is blooming, so it's about time to put on supers. <laughs> that's, that's true. Our, our ladies are booming out here in Houston. Um, we've been excited because they are, we've been splitting, uh, one hive into three very often around here right now. Um, so if y'all know the math on that, that's good math. Uh, it does cost you a little bit on the, on the, uh, the boxes and, and things of like that, but, oh, but oftentimes here in, in the Houston area, we're giving these out and they're going to other people. So it's, it's kind of a community service to be able to do so, which we're very grateful. Uh, Will Reburn, Kentucky. I had to find the microphone there. Uh, swarms are happening like crazy, probably like everywhere else. Uh, don't have any latest information about any new happenings right now. But as I find them, I post them. And you guys seen pictures of our collaboration oh, yeah. uh, set up with uh, E.J. Snyder and Gary Golding, which I hope those turn out real good. And the other guy that was going to be doing... Uh, three talk shows a week and he's supposed to be talking about us also. Awesome. Um, you know, the, the more you spread the word about the thing, the more people get involved and it's, it's pretty impressive. Again, remember we're a people organization. We're not a perfect organization, but man, we really do care about each other and we learn as much as we can from each other. And it's pretty beautiful, you know, connections are first priority and then we learn as much as we can. But at the end of the day, it's about each other. Um, let's see. We have, Trying to go East Coast over here. Do we have anybody on the East Coast? Helen, you're the one on the East Coast that I can see. Hi. Hi. I am so lucky. I caught a swarm on Sunday. It was probably one of mine. And then I'm on on Monday. Oh, wow. But, um, so, but I've been making calls um, to try and reach out to some of the newbies who are going to be matched, but not matched quite yet. And that's going really well. And I think people are very excited. Some of them have found mentors in their local bee clubs. Um, but yeah, everything is going really well here. You know, um, in Western North Carolina, which is where I am, it's totally different than Eastern North Carolina where they were having swarms probably last month. <laughs> um, but we we just started, so um, very exciting stuff. Um, and I'm so excited for all the newbies and everybody who is on this call uh good on you welcome so to the as y'all as y'all know we have uh the state leaders that are in or in their states and they organize in the way that they they choose right this is a guideline organization it's not full of a bunch of rules but what, there's a lot of freedom in that and so for example jim uh is running uh idaho and oregon and has a lot of freedom in those things so we have our state leaders right their roles and responsibilities are to show up and be available their emails are on the website um, under the leadership tab, if you ever need your state leader. And then we put some special teams in place this past couple months. And one of those is Helen's team, which is our call team. So kind of our QRF, if you know, you know, familiar with um, uh, military jargon, our quick reaction force, but really call, calling, seeing how you're doing, explaining the, uh, the way that we do things in the process and getting feedback. So you have a friendly voice on the other end of the phone, and she'll be building out a team as well to be calling everybody in the organization. And then we have Matt, who is leading our Facebook group team. He's out of North Carolina as well. What a coincidence right there. You're really nice out there, I guess. And so Matt's running that with uh, a handful of people as well. And that's to get you um, involved on the Facebook group page. So we're talking about engagement you know, posting things, us sharing those things, learning from each other, et cetera. Again, we're not all experts, but we do care. Um, and then we have a one-to-one -one, uh, distance that should show up uh, here in the future as well. So a lot of cool things coming from y'all's feedback and uh, just continued growth of the organization. Uh, number ways, we're at over 5,100 currently uh, throughout all 50 states. And then we have the expansions to other areas as well, which we will brief accordingly. So thank you to all the state leaders and reps that have talked today. Oh, Dean, you're in West Virginia. You're out there too. Do you want to say a few words about your bees? Uh, well, we're splitting right and left, and we've got our swarm boxes up and ready to go, and so far, we haven't had any swarms, but a few of our friends have. <laughs> okay. 
That's awesome. And by the way, with all these state leaders, this is an open organization where you can volunteer anytime you want, right? We go to um, the, the conferences and the events, anything that's on that website, we have the events tab. There's two things on that. One, you should be able to go to each one of those if you'd like to, if they're in your area, please show up. Also, if there's an event like say Craig Midgets out in Tennessee doing a conference, go with them. Like, that's awesome. Go volunteer with them. Have a great time. Uh, oftentimes, there are some free tickets involved. We don't. That's not in every state or every conference, but I know here in Texas, if we're speakers at that, you get two free tickets and you can take people to it, right? That's pretty cool. So check out the events page, um, not only for the ones that are there, but also for the events that you might know of that we don't. There's a tab on there that says add an event. And you can add that event and our admin will put that onto the website publicly. So if it's a cost, just put the cost there. People have a freedom to choose whether they want to go to free events or something that costs money. That's awesome. The other thing too is um, the resource page. Please go to the resource page. You got state resources, master beekeeping programs. The scholarship information is on there as well for the reimbursements and also our, all our national organizations. Um, there are also hero resources as well things that might support you in efforts outside of beekeeping, such as finances, mental health, and things of that nature. All right. So there's tons of resources on the website. We want to be that hub um, and we can only do it with your support as well. Any great ideas are welcome. And then we'll go through them and add them to the website as we see fit, which is awesome. All right. As of uh, the Hives for Heroes um, meeting tonight, because we are very respectful of your time, it is eight o'clock. Again, we are Hives for Heroes, connecting veterans and first responders to beekeeping all over the country through connection, purpose, relationships, and service, all in your local areas for your good. So please continue to go to the website and continue to be involved. Our meeting is done for today, but as the doctor said, he's still open for appointments. So here it is. Cool. All Thanks, right. Steve. Yeah. So if you um, if you need to go, thank you guys. I hope there was something uh, that was of interest. And if you want to stay, I got one more case. I have one more to share with you guys. So let's plow through that. Let me see. Can you guys can you guys see my screen? The right screen. Yep. Am I doing this yes. right? Okay, yes. but I can't, I can't see it. Um, she, she it's showing me. your uh, presenter's view right now. Boom. How about this? There we go. Is that okay? All right. Cool. This is the third case. So this is a this is also pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, I was pretty nervous with this one because of the size of the patient. So this was, as you can see, a little cockatiel that weighed eighty grams, or not even like three ounces, I think. So and you see this big nasty wound there, and as you can see, that guy is. Uh, if he could talk, he would probably say, "Hello, I'm naked." Uh, he's a feather plucker, um, and. Um, he unfortunately sometimes what these guys do when they're out of feathers they keep plucking away and um, then they start into self-mutilation and so they literally uh, open pick themselves raw and if they do that for a couple of times it actually transforms into a cancer and so this is exactly what we see here so biopsied it it came back again carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma so again, it's another one where we don't have chemotherapy. Birds are in by nature um, very, very resistant to radiation. Uh, so again, chemotherapy was not an option. Radiation was not an option. So the the way to go about that would have been radical resection of the whole body wall, which would have not gone well. So again, I talked to Leona if she'd be willing to do it. She said yes. So that's awesome. So here we measure we measure it, and because because the the patient was so small, 80 grams, um, when I did the math of how many bee stings we need, um, my math came out to literally half a bee sting. I'm like, all right, how do I do half a bee sting? And you see me here giving half a bee sting into the tumor. So how do you do that? So luckily, I have that little thing, which is called a bee whisper. So this is a way how you milk venom out of the honeybees uh, without killing them. Uh, which is awesome. So it's basically kind of like looks like a little electric guitar there. And it's powered by a double A battery that you put in, you put on, you switch it on, and you have a micro currency uh, going through there, the B lands on it, gets a little bit tickled by the micro currency, and goes like sneezes, 
and poof, poof, have a little bit of venom on that blade, all right? So a little bit of venom comes out at the end. But like I said, it doesn't kill them. And you actually see they walk over it. It doesn't really matter. It's just like when they land on it, they're like, whoa. And then um, you have that. And because as you all know, venom contains an alarm pheromone. So it's recruiting more and more bees. And so as you see, they're kind of like, well, what kind of weird bear is attacking our hive? I think the video overwhelmed the chart. Oh, let me see. Can you can you guys hear me? We can now. Okay, oh, cool. Yeah. So that was a little video problem. Okay, cool. So yeah, so then, um, then like I said, it turns into a scene from Breaking Bad. You just remove that glass plate underneath. The water is evaporated, and what leaves you is with the dried venom here. So you scrape that together. You put it in a red top tube here. You weigh it on a very sensitive scale. So these are thirty-six milligrams of bee venom, and then I can just reconstitute it with saline, and then I have my stock solution, and then based on the mass based how much saline I'm going to put in, I know that maybe one milliliter is equal to a hundred things, a thousand things, 10 things, whatever it is. So, and this way, then I can literally titrate my amount that I injected to half a bee sting. So that's what I did with this, as you saw me, and this literally here, that's our little patient 20 minutes after, you see, it gives him the munchies again, zero side effects, which to me, it's still a little bit surprising, right? Because they don't even pay attention to it. So we all know when we get stung, we obviously, scratch, you know, kind of rub it, you know. These animals don't really care, which is really cool. So this was the original. This was two weeks after that single injection. Look what it did to the tumor. It literally killed it. It necrosed it off. It's falling off that, that superficial layer. And underneath, you actually see... So I injected it right here, if you remember from that certain. And as you see, this looks much more like normal tissue in comparison to this. This is, still looks raw, like nasty tumor tissue versus this looks like it wants to heal. So I was really excited. So yeah, here's that nasty dead skin. So then I felt a little bit more emboldened. I said, look, we kind of like, we're just kind of keeping this in a check situation. So yes, we destroy some tumor tissue, but it grows so aggressively so fast can I escalate it up to a full beast thing? And I want to say, yeah, sure, go ahead, do it. So here's here's then we escalated it up. And um, the problem with one full beast thing like this, fresh given, is that obviously I have to put all my chips into that area right here versus with that dilution method that you saw before, I could actually inject it into multiple areas. So, you know, everything has an advantage and a disadvantage. So here we see the venom sack is still pumping venom in. And there we go. So here again, this is where we injected. That skin is very smooth versus this is still rough and rough. So uh, what I wanted to see is like, hey, are we, do, are we again causing any damage? Here is the white blood cell count. An animal or specifically a bird, if it has less than 5,000 white blood cell, I would consider this immune compromised. So this animal came in with 3,500, which to me means that animal was exhausting its immune system. And boom, putting it on the bee venom, now it's 7,000. That's fantastic. The immune system is working again. What kind of cells are responding? The heterophils, my analogy, if you look at the immune, if you look at the immune system, like, uh, uh, you know, like the police or kind of like the people that keep things in check, the heterophils would be my SWAT team, right? So versus the eosinophils, the lymphocytes, the monocytes, they're kind of like my mall cops. Yeah, maybe they have a clipboard, maybe they have pepper spray and a Segway, but they don't have a semi-automatic rifle. That's the heterophils. That's the one that I want to send in there. And that's oddly enough, that's what the bee venom really recruits. This is what's happening here, which is crazy to think about it. That, that immune system is like, wow, we need more assault rifles pointed at that tumor. And that's exactly what's happening in the body because I can't control. The body is smart enough. That's pretty amazing. 
this is just a PCV. It's like a hematocrit. It tells you what's the formed, uh, what's the amount of formed versus liquid part of the blood. And so this stays stable. It's great. All right, I'm not doing anything. This is the chemistry. So from papers, we know that B venom actually decreases blood glucose and we see a little bit. So this is normal around 300. So it's just decreased it a little bit, but not significantly. So it's okay. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. This is an, a value that is actually happening when you have tissue, tissue damage. And as you can imagine, that initial body wall problem, that tumor destroyed a lot of normal tissue was really high. Around 400 is normal. I was actually kind of worried that that enzyme would go a little bit higher because we're killing, right? I mean, it's kind of like we're killing tumor cells. So I would have expected this to go up. Uh-uh, I was wrong. What is it? It's actually going to normalize, which was very surprising to me. Phosphorus is a waste product that the kidney needs to eliminate. Six is way too high for my liking. With the bee venom, it goes down to absolute normal levels. Uric acid is also an end product of protein metabolism. So usually I don't like to see uric acid above 10 at all. So once I saw initially the uric acid 17 and a phosphorus at six, I talked to that owner, I said, listen, I really don't know if we have a good prognosis because I think your bird is in renal failure already. Well, look what a venom does. It brings it below 10. It's amazing to me. I mean, actually, you inject that venom into these animals and the body reacts exactly like it knows how to react. It's just fascinating. So, but that wasn't enough for me. So what I wanted to see is like, obviously I injected into this area. I didn't inject into that area. So I, I re-biopsied it. I took a little piece of, of that tissue out and I took a little piece of that tissue and I wanted to see if the pathologist can actually tell if there's a difference. And sure enough, so now here's where I screwed up again. I was so excited that I accidentally switched the cassettes around. So the samples that I took from the injected is that one and the one that I didn't inject, I labeled raw. So I switched it around. So this one should be the one that I didn't inject, which says, yep, it's still squamous cell carcinoma. The one that I injected with B venom, now the pathologist isn't 100% sure anymore. It's like, I'm suspected squamous cell, but I see a lot of necrosis and revascularization. That's basically the body healing itself. So, and what I'm seeing here in that, in that uh, comments is they called me out. I said, dude, did you, did you change? Did you mix up those things? Because we think the repair that we see is probably where you injected. I'm like, yeah, okay, guilty as charged. Um, so it, it was so marked that they even called me out. It's like, you know what? I think you did a mistake. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But basically what they're telling me is they're seeing exactly what has been described in those Petri dish experiments, that basically the bee venom goes through that mix, that, that mix of the tissue. You always have cancer cells surrounded by normal cells, right? Not everything, not 100% is cancer. So you always have normal cells in between. And when you inject chemotherapy into those things, my analogy is it's a little bit like forest fire. Let's say you have an invasive, like invasive fungus in a tree or invasive parasite in a tree and you identify 20 trees on a five acre lot. What do the foresters do? They say, you know what, to be safe, let's just torch that whole five acre lot just to make sure that, you know, it's not going to spread into these other trees. That's what chemotherapy does, right? So this is why we have side effects of chemotherapy. This is why our hairs will fall out. This is why we don't want to eat anymore because we are literally sloughing our GI mucosa. This is why we feel nauseated. So chemotherapy does a big number on healthy tissues too. What they're describing here is exactly what has been described with bee venom in, in vitro where you have cancer cells in a dish and you have normal cells in between. And what the researchers saw that weirdly enough, the bee venom just literally goes through that in vitro dish and identifies the cancer cells, kills those cancer cells and leaves the normal cells intact. And that's what we're seeing here. So basically the changes observed in these cells are consistent with individual necrosis and apoptosis, which is individual cell death. 
So the analogy to my forest would be that you have a forest ranger walking through the infected uh, you know, lot of, 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 of forest and identifying these individual trees and marks them with spray paint and said, that tree has the fungus, that tree has the fungus, and that tree has the fungus. Cut those trees out, burn that wood, leave the other trees alone. And that's exactly what venom does in those cancer cells, which to be, I mean, it's amazing. And that's, again, we don't know how they do it, but that's what it does. And that's, and that's proof of it. So again, unfortunately, that cancer was super aggressive. And again, those are some of those first initial cases where I was very scared of killing my patients with the venom. So what I've learned from all those cases is that I need to be more aggressive with the cancer because I don't see side effects. The fact that I was too careful probably, you know, advanced that cancer in other areas. And unfortunately, again, that bird died two weeks, uh, two months later, and the owner didn't inform us to do a necropsy to look for um, other damage. So I have talked to this with other veterinarians. They have adopted some of these cases too. This is Dr. K. She's a friend of mine. She has her own. She has her own TV show, National Geographic. Watch it. I think it's Emergency Vets or something like this. And so she, after she talked to me, she's like a ferret with lymphoma. She's like, yeah, she gives it bee venom, manuka, IV, Texol, which is chemotherapy, and Red Devil is another chemotherapy. And so she said, animal is doing really well. She's giving it right over the spleen right here. And this is where you see that. Um, and lymphoma is a nasty one. It's a nasty one. Usually those ferrets live only for a couple of weeks. She sent me this. She said, hey, that ferret was on euthanized five months later. So again, we're not curing anything with the bee venom, but five months with an aggressive lymphoma, it's actually a really good thing. So that gave the owner enough time to say goodbye to their little beloved ferret. So in my book, that's actually already a success because without that, I think it would have been not even five weeks uh, before that animal would have said goodbye. She also used it in iguana. It didn't do too much. I didn't expect it because iguanas are a little bit different. Reptiles are a little bit different um, in their cancer presentation. Here's another colleague that used it in rats um, and he got 50% to where he wanted to be. All right, so here's my summary slide. I think, you know, what I've learned so far is that I'm getting more and more emboldened. I'm going to be more and more aggressive using it because, like I said, I've yet to see a side effect, the negative side effect. My recommendation is now to go weekly with those injections and then potentially try to do a follow-up surgery then. So what we call using that as an adjuvant treatment. There is actually thousands and thousands of paper. If you look through the peer-reviewed uh, literature, thousands and thousands of papers out there. It's a riddle to me why this is not more popular, why not more people use it, because we have really good evidence. So lots of stuff written up on it. So yeah, we know that venom alone is good against cancer, neurological disorders. So a lot of there's a lot of good evidence for those neurological disorders. There's neurodegenerative disease, like, like what you know as Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, literally all of those diseases where we are, what I would consider a little bit with the back against the wall, where in Western medicine, everything that we have is just basically the aim is to slow it down. Well, with bee venom, we have more and more evidence that it actually can do stuff. There is actually something called American AP Therapy Society. So uh, um, it's not as prolific from a production point of view as I would like to see it, but there is some there is some plan to organize that a little bit. So this is our teaching apiary at the university. So I got I got to thank a lot of people because I get a lot of I got a lot of. Um, support from our dean to the maintenance crew to the landscaping crew everybody is super supportive and i couldn't obviously do it when i'm all alone some of the money that i got i got from the georgia beekeeper association so i'm always grateful to and uh, willing to acknowledge them because uh, most of that stuff couldn't have been done without their financial support for that so that is literally it for me so and i'm like i said if, if anybody has any more questions i'm happy to chat with you so, Dr. Meyer, the, uh, Steve had to jump off because he had to go pick up his daughter. So sure, sure. he asked me if I would take over. Um, we met at all of the Georgia 
Beekeepers Association conferences yeah. so far. <laughs> um, going through, looking, see if we have questions. Can you get the same results with fresh raw honey instead of bleached honey? And how oh, is that? Are you 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 are you fading out a little bit? Are you are you at that question? Can you get uh, with fresh raw honey versus manukan? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, again, I, you know, I can show you a couple of papers where they did, they did a study on, on Manuka honey and yes, indeed, uh, Manuka honey seems to be fairly powerful and there is something called a unique Manuka factor, a UMF, and uh, happily to put that on the label. Um, here's my little bit sarcastic spiel about it. I think the Manuka honey, as you all know, the vast majority of that industry comes from New Zealand. Um, I think they got a wicked good PR team on their hands and um, and they're doing a great job uh, 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 like beating the drum on this. And yes, there is, they doing one of, again, a little bit more on a serious note, what they're doing really good with their industry is they're doing really good quality control. So they're looking at this. So if you order a batch this year that says, you know, it's a unique Manuka factor, 20 plus, and you order it two years later, a 20 plus, there is probably 20 plus. So they're, they're doing really good quality control. However, what I think is potentially a little, little bit taken out of proportion is the price they're asking for their product. So I, as you saw in my lecture, I use my own honey um, because it is raw. And the, the person who asked that question made the, made the point absolutely correctly. you got to use raw honey. That's the key word here. Any kind of processed honey, any kind of honey that is pasteurized because you're heating it up, you're losing those bioactive substances, you're denaturing proteins. So it has to be raw honey. But, you know, will the wound heal with my chocha honey? Absolutely. Will it heal with manuka honey? Absolutely. Will it heal 10 times faster with Manuka honey? I don't think so. Does it cost 10 times more? You betcha, right? So maybe the Manuka honey would accelerate it, you know, 18 hours, 24 hours. I don't care. Is it worth that extra expense? Ex extra expense? Not in my book. So yeah, if you want to pay the money for the Manuka honey, if you have a really reliable source that the honey where you're getting A is raw, is not contaminated with some weird chemicals that are being put in hives while honey supers are still on with whatever, um, that's why I like to use my own honey because I know that I'm not going to have any kind of trace elements of amitraz or whatever we use because I'm very strict about it. I got to teach my students how to be good beekeepers. So that's a long-winded answer to any raw honey will be your friend. Um, if you have a big wallet, use Manuka honey. Uh, another question was, how do you determine the dosage? Is it based off of weight or the yeah, type great, of cancer? Great question. So, uh, the so especially going back to my birds, and this is why I was so nervous with that cockatiel bird weighing 80 grams. So um, when I had my first bird patient, I was kind of like, oh, we usually consider birds to be maybe a little bit more sensitive to toxins. Um, the canary in the coal mine analogy comes up, right? So um, any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, you know, kind of poison in the system registers with birds much, much quicker than with mammals. So I was really nervous, but I looked through the literature and sure enough, I found quite a few papers uh, coming from mainly South America, uh, published by Sioux veterinarians, where maybe they had an exhibit like the Macaw exhibit out, and then suddenly Africanized honeybees, you know, went through that zoo and just stung everybody to death. Um, and so, to their to their uh, honor, what they did is they actually wrote a a paper to start with about it, but B, when they did their post mortem exam on it they actually reported how many stings those birds, macaws or pigeons or whatever, how many stings they got. And there were always a few birds that survived that attack. And so again, they did a great job writing these papers. What they did is they anesthetized those survivors and counted the bee stings on the survivors. 
So I knew how many bee stings would kill a macaw, and I knew how many bee stings a macaw could get away with. They also reported their body weight, so I was able to kind of deduct and get to a how many bee stings per kilogram of body weight can I give my birds and feel safe about it? And so I came to the conclusion that about 150 grams, my bird should weigh at least 150 grams to get one bee sting. So now you see why I was sweating because that bird, the cockatiel was 80 grams, more or less just half. This is why I'm like, okay, I can, I need a half a bee sting with that. So I go by that. Um, and the other, the, uh, the question about the IV honey is based on a paper where a researcher actually did that in mice. Uh, and so I used, I used his recommendation based on how much honey I can check the IV. Uh, looks like you got a person interested in Conference later. Yeah. I, I um, can barely hear you, can you? I don't know if yeah, your you microphone you, is. So, but I can, I can read. Reach... now? Yeah, oh, much better. <laughs> I was, I was splitting my headphones with my wife so she could also hear. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I can see one question is, I'm just going to go through. Have you published your findings? Writing them up as we speak. I actually just answered an email from my student who I'm making a write up. Uh, so come and stay tuned pretty soon. Human trials, bee sting therapy, like for example, that one paper that I that I mentioned um, initially with that liposarcoma, actually that's where I got my idea. So again, I'm not this crazy scientist. I'm using existing data that is either in the literature and human medicine or in vitro studies and apply those. So yes, that's where I got my idea. Lyme disease, awesome question. Um, absolutely, there is really good evidence about Lyme disease. And uh, let me plug that show. Um, if you do have access to Netflix, there is a series called Unwell. And um, it, 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 um, each episode is on some fringe health topics. And I think it was episode number six. It's about AP therapy. And Lyme disease is really highlighted uh, because you see a lot of people that have been diagnosed with Lyme disease that Western medicine left them alone because nothing nothing that western medicine could offer them helped and then eventually they you know maybe some friend says hey have you considered beef venom and they're like you know what i got nothing to lose anyway because western medicine left and um, amazing and there's some really good peer-reviewed papers where borrelia burgdorferi which is a spirochete is a weird bacteria which causes lyme disease and can evade the immune system because it can hide in cells, it goes into cartilage, it goes into blood cells. It, it does weird stuff where it really tricks the body that it removes itself out of the bloodstream. And then all those antibiotics that are given even IV are, are, are kind of potentially useless. B venom finds the Borrelia and kills the Borrelia. So Lyme disease is definitely one of those top, top uh, contenders. Um, that uh, that is great for venom therapy. What about propolis? Yes, we have done propolis too. And I've recently published a paper, again, an in vitro study on propolis, really good results. Um, the problem with propolis is that it has to go through, you know, usually ethanol extraction. So it's a little bit processed, but yeah, propolis is, is one of those miracle things that has antiviral activity, antibacterial, antifungal activity. So again, it's a little bit sounds like snake oil. Um, I just focused a little bit my research on venom because I just personally think it's a little bit more sexy and a little bit more powerful. So, but yeah, probably is good stuff. HIV and immune, absolutely. Uh, yeah, um, as as I saw, uh, as I showed you with this one slide where it really revs up the immune system and primes the immune system um, to be on guard and alerts. It's, it's a complex thing. It's um, There's a lot of paper where they show interleukin cytokines getting really um, encouraged and you have something like natural killer cells that go out. And this is probably how it works when you have, when you have a tumor with normal cells in between where that effect that I have shown with these biopsies where that where the bee venom actually probably sensitizes these natural killer cells that are basically like your 
your forest rangers on steroids that go through that forest and really identify these individual trees or cells and say, this tree is sick, this cell is expressing weird proteins. That's the one that needs to be killed. The neighboring cells just looks like a normal cell, not a cancer cell, leave that alone. We're not gonna eat that one. So, and and to be honest, I this is where I see the future of AP therapy is not that it wants to cure or it can cure cancer. I wouldn't go that far, but what we consider adjuvant therapy, if you know somebody that has cancer, if you talk to them a little bit, pure chemotherapy or pure, it's very rare. Usually there is an adjuvant treatment, and the adjuvant treatment a lot of times is chemotherapy plus radiation chemotherapy plus surgery so you maybe use the chemotherapy to shrink it and then the the oncological surgeons move in to remove that or they shrink it initially with radiation and then follow up so most of the cancers are not being just treated with chemotherapy alone and so this is where i see AP therapy as another adjuvant where just like in that liposarcoma paper in that human where you use chemotherapy, you shrink the tumor and then you move in with surgery or you finish it off with chemotherapy. So, so I think that is the, that is the future of that. Are the there, there was a question have... about, um, there was a question about double blind placebo studies. And I remembered from the Georgia conference where you, spoke about a study that was done on mice, I believe, where yeah. one batch was given placebo, one batch yeah. is given chemo, one batch is given honey, and one batch was given honey plus chemo. Well done. Well, you paid attention. Love it. So, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so yes, to, these, these good I'm, studies, so when I mentioned, when I mentioned peer-reviewed papers, that's usually the design process because other guys, other, uh, other, other than that, it would never be published. They would say, yeah, that's good for you, but you're lacking a control study. So so when you when you talk about peer review studies, these are all, they have been screened by the peers and the peers, they want to shoot you down. If you submit a paper and you want to do this, there's always one peer reviewer that said, yeah, I don't like this because you didn't do this or whatever. So then you go back to the drawing board and you, or, or you tell them, no, no, we actually corrected for this. So yes, when I talk about good scientific evidence, that means that, it is accounted for the placebo effect. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so my question was whether it was, there were any double blind research. It's not just blind research. It says a, a control gives you a blind research, but right. if your researcher knows what they're putting in, then they can impact exactly. the, the no, data as yes. well. So and a double blind is very important. Double blind is absolutely. And if you do a literature and you find a lot of, and like I said, those papers, a lot of the papers have a very high impact factor, means they're doing really good studies because they're, cite, they're cited in journals like Science and Nature. doesn't get much better like that. And yes, they, they have very, very good study designs. And a lot of times the researcher doesn't even know. They might inject something to the mouse, but they don't even know if they're injecting the venom, the yeah, saline, or the chemotherapy. And then at the end, the pathologist will tell them, oh yeah, that tumor was, you know, so yes, that, that's a great comment. And yes, that's good science. And yes, venom and stuff withstands that scientific challenge. This There's is more a of a selfish question. Yeah. Um, you know any beekeepers in Poland? Um, no, I don't, but I'm going to fly into Poland this June. So, uh, and maybe I'll meet some, yeah. I'm there very shortly and I'm trying to line up meeting with a uh, beekeeper while I'm there, just trying to track one down. Oh, there's like Eastern Europe. And to be honest, like a lot of paper with AP therapy and agriculture come from Eastern Europe. Um, they they have been doing this for, for much longer than us in the Americas here. Um, good people to talk to, lots of anecdotal evidence. You know, you have lots of old guys that are like, ah, like, I want to be sting because I have gout or whatever. And they let themselves sting repeatedly and and so yeah lots of anecdotal evidence but they have been practicing it for a very long time so so good stuff out there um there is one question that i have here that is like the bee venom trap available public absolutely that's how i got it um and it's called the bee whisperer and it actually comes from slovenia or or you yeah i think slovenia so yeah it's called a bee whisperer um the guy ships it to you good stuff so yeah 
Do you see a tipping point in the US, Western medicine? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, let me get cynical for a moment because I'm, you know, I'm reading this. I'm going down this rabbit hole, reading literally thousands and thousands of papers. And it's like, what's going on here? There's so much good scientific evidence. Why is nobody talking about it? And then eventually I found the answer. And again, maybe this is me being cynic, but you know what? Nobody can make big bucks with that. Nobody can have the medical bee from Bering or Ingelheim or from Soedis or whatever, right? I mean, basically, I don't know. That's me being a European skeptic about pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, when you don't have a force behind it where they say, oh, yeah, that could make us $200 million a year, you know, that's where there's not a lot of research money pumped into, right? I mean, uh, yesterday or the day before, I've heard in the news that those Ozempic injections or whatever, those weight loss injection things, right, that everybody's taking out, they're selling them for thousands and thousands of dollars now, right? Because, oh, they see there's a market and we need to make our money back. So, you know, there's nobody that sells you a medical bee for $500 a bee. That's probably what would be needed to get the tipping point. But like I said, there is science um, I, I'm, and that's why I'm so grateful for the Georgia Beekeepers Association because they are the ones that give me money to pay for this blood work that you saw. I didn't want my owners to have an additional expense. So all those blood work, all those histopaths, all these test results to show scientifically that my that my um, drug is my bee venom therapy is doing anything. This is all done paid for by the Georgia Beekeepers Association because. Um, you know, I don't have a pharmaceutical company backing me up because they're going to be like, yeah, this is cute what you're doing, but how are we going to make any money out of it? So that's honestly, if you partner, if you partner with Ozempic after all your studies that you showed everybody after they got stung, got hungry. So <laughs> we start eating yeah. enough snacks. We'll need the Ozempic. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I should ask uh, Kellogg's or, or, or Fruit Loops manufacturers, like, or whatever. It's, it, it's all about marketing. <laughs> it's all about yeah it's like hey you know i got the munchies uh here there we Jesus. go but yeah i mean i i wish I, and to be honest Burritos. you know i mean it's, it's all jokes aside i mean if i would be if i would be diagnosed with cancer or whatever these days i would insist that my doctor includes that and in my and and if the doctor says dude you're 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 crazy i'm not doing this on my license i'm like i'm gonna do it myself i'm a veterinarian i can place an id catheter and i can you know i can sting myself but that's how convinced i i am that uh that there is benefits to it so but that's that's just me Let's see we got any more questions <laughs> my <laughs> wife says can she be the first to volunteer <laughs> <laughs> It's really funny because, to be honest, I I read that study that um, that inspired me, uh, you know, that um, to use the IV. Um, there's quite a few studies. If you look at this, it's it's shocking. There's actually quite a few studies where they gave IV honey to you know the mice, to sheep, to goats. There's a lot of stuff out there, and you know, it's it's all of these papers kind of conclude was like, wow, that was interesting because. There's a lot of positive. Uh, we can't explain it. So mm, what's going on? So, but the guy that did it with the mouse study, I actually contacted him and I just actually emailed with him today about my research and he was very complimentary. And 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 so, anyway, so we texted a little bit and he said, based on his cancer research in mice, he, he's a human, he works in a human hospital in the Emirates actually. And he said, look, all the data. And he's like, I want to use that in human cancer patients. And and uh, the board that oversees, obviously, <laughs> clinical research, they obviously lost their cool and says, dude, no, you're not going to inject in humans. You know, this is a little bit too far. So this is why he's really interested in my research, because he's kind of like, wow, you're doing it in animals, in clinical cancer patients, and it's working. I, you know, please keep me updated. And, and so what he just sent me, his latest paper, it's one of those papers where he gavashes honey into rats, um, into mice, um, and orally, because he says, well, if I can show that oral uptake of honey interferes with tumor growth, maybe then 
in our hospital in the Emirates, maybe they adopt that uh, recommendation that our oncological patients should actually eat maybe four ounces of honey a day or something, you know, like a, a healthier, a healthier amount of honey than you would do with your two tablespoons a day. And yes, of course, he has shown that oral uptake of honey is not as powerful as IV because you obviously digest some of those proteins and stuff like this, but yet still the results were there and they show, uh, you know, those rats that were gavashed honey um, have slower tumor growth in comparison to the ones that were gavashed saline or some other uh, a placebo uh, substance. So, so um, yeah, I'm, th there's some there's some good evidence out there for sure. So people are dwindling away. I'm I'm happy to hang out, but other than that, I'm I'm really excited that you guys were excited about it, and um, yeah. I should probably come off meat before I start talking. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it looks like no more questions. Last chance, anybody, if you want some questions. Um, this is Sherry from Northern Illinois, one of the um, uh, state reps. Um, wonderful, wonderful information. I'm, I'm also a nurse midwife, and I like to do um, non-Western um, therapy. So this is super interesting to me. And um, I also have suffered from Lyme's disease, so I'm really, I'm really excited about that part of it. But um, I was also wondering, do you speak with other like uh, clubs? And also, the Illinois State Bee Association is uh, meeting in our area, and we'll be looking for speakers in 2025. So, kind of try to get just to know if you'd be willing to help. Yeah, usually to be honest, I'm I'm like I don't thrive on Zoom. I I I really prefer to do a live uh a live thing. Um I mean I can do it. It's not my favorite thing because I I just I just don't like to look at a computer. So um <laughs> I can do it. Um usually I request an apple pie as payment. See, that's a, that's a problem that I can't get an apple pie through Zoom. So, but uh, I don't know. Ask me, um, ask me again, and maybe four or five months. Uh, you have my email. Email me. Uh, um, where where in where in uh, Illinois are you guys based out of? If I would come physically to if you say, if you say Chicago, he's out. <laughs> well, we're outside of chicago um well, you know what? i'll keep i'll keep that in mind i need to i need to visit a couple of friends in chicago anyway and so then maybe we can maybe we can combine us and i'll just drive up to chicago and then add my little my little talk for you guys into <laughs> that would be awesome because i'd probably i would work on getting several clubs together for that um because we have party. I, I, yes, definitely. And I have my own apples and out of my own apple orchard. So I'd be all over making an apple pie. Oh, man, I'm there. Homemade apple pie. You have me at that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I, well, this has been amazing. So cool. I just really want to thank you for this. Yeah. I mean, if you're into it, like if it's Lyme disease, man, watch that. Watch that thing um, or Google it. Uh, Lyme disease, bee venom, you find some amazing, like really good scientific evidence that Borrelia, I mean, like obviously the standard treatment of can human medicine is tetracyclines at the moment, IV tetracyclines. Um, they did, they, they exposed tetracycline, they, they both uh, ex, uh, Borrelia, Gurdorfi to tetracycline, it, it, you know, it, it, it reduces it. They exposed it to bee venom, oh, it, it kicked the butt. Um, wow. And then watch watch that Netflix thing. It's it's a you know it's a little bit sensational. Like a lot of real scientific people are going, wah, wah, wah. but you know to me there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. If you have a bunch of people that are willing to sting themselves on a regular basis, and they have gone through the whole Western treatment regime and and nothing works for them anymore. You know, I'm like, I wouldn't be that arrogant to to snub my nose at that. And like, you know, if, because these people are the best evidence, you know, they're not they're not stinging themselves for fun because it's so cool. 
they're doing it because they're seeing significant improvement in their quality of life. And, and that is meaningful to me. Oh, big time. Way better than, because I went through months of treatment where I got um, insulin, IV insulin, and once my blood sugars dropped, then I got the IV antibiotics, and then I got triggered to bring my blood sugars back up, which was just ugly and yep. super expensive. So yep. I probably got in my B yard naked. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just that you know, with um, um, you may want to actually go on this American Apicultural Society uh, site, and and I think you can identify. Uh, you know, human uh, practitioners that are embracing that because as you can imagine, you know, the lawyers are going to be like, like if, if that's why I said, if I go to my doctor, I would insist that they would include that into my regimen. And most of the people is like, dude, I'm, I don't know anything about it. I'm not touching it because if you get anaphylaxis, you, your family gets to sue me. I have not, you know, so, and, and so they're all lawyering up about it. Um, and so, but there's a few brave individuals who say, you know what, I'm I'm doing it, and here is a piece of paper that you need to sign that you know you you or your family can sue me if something goes wrong. But um, and so again, be, like I don't know, there's probably a couple of lawyers here to call. I don't want to want to throw them all under under the, um, you know. But I, I they think all they all have also, bedtimes and already signed off. Yeah. So, <laughs> So, uh, so, but I think that's also another explanation why I think in other countries like European countries, South American countries, like why this gets a little bit more embraced because we don't go around and sue each other like crazy like that. And, and I think this is why like there's people like medical people that are less risk at worst. They say, Hey, if you want me to do this, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be by your side. If you want to even animate yourself, I'm here with an EpiPen if you need or whatever. Right. Versus here, you, I think there's really brave healthcare workers that say, I'm with you on that journey and I will do my best, you know, and I'm not afraid of the lawyers. So, so this is, this makes me a lot of times very sad that it comes to that, to that stage in healthcare. But that's what it is in, in the US of A. So, oh, most definitely. Obstetrics is one of the worst jobs to be in if you don't worry about getting sued. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, yeah, do, do it, do it well. I would definitely say don't do it on your own. Have somebody there that, you know, just in case you would have an anaphylaxis, just have EpiPens or whatever. Um, do it thoughtfully, but man, um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of good evidence out there that it can improve your quality of life. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And I will get back to you um, on a visit to Chicago. Right so, on. Right on. Awesome. With cool. apple pie. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you much. And you have a wonderful evening. My pleasure. Thanks for attending. Yes, you're welcome. Come off right. mute again. Last I chance. Anybody else have a question? <laughs> Dr. You... Merrick, did you uh, share your contact information that, so that we can send it, uh, questions to you? I, 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 I mean, my my email. You can find me online. Look at Meyer. You know, Meyer J uh, at uga dot edu. Uh, you know, but I mean, my profile is on the UGA side with my email. But it's my last name, M A Y E R J at U G A dot E D U. Thank you very much. I uh, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado, with whereas uh, Colorado State University has a very good. I was program. I was just there doing a locum at uh, at CSU for a month. So I I have a very good friend who's an oncologist that I'm going to call her tomorrow. <laughs> oh, cool! <laughs> this is, yeah, this is I mean. They, they got the world's best veterinary oncology program up there. Um, that's for sure. From a vet is is your friend human oncologist or veterinary oncologist? Veterinarian. Oh, okay. So yeah, I was I was just up there. I I you know, I, I love oncology. It's a little bit my my pet peeve in exotic medicine. So this is probably why I uh using it in those patients too. Um, so, but yeah, they got, you, 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 you have the black belts uh, in oncology up there. And I, if you talk to them, I would be really interested to hear their hopefully qualified comments on that. And, uh, yeah. um, I, you know, it's like, they're doing God's work up there. That's for sure. Well, I guess my question is, are they doing any of this B venom therapy here? 
Um, I, to be honest, I don't want to. I don't want to widely guess and say no because I haven't. I haven't talked to them about it. Um, um, and I don't know. Ask them. Ask them. And I would be very happy to talk to them if they're interested. But uh, you know, like I, I would love. I would love to see them embrace it. Like I said, as an adjuvant, and like I was just emailing with my friend and the Emirates and when he sent me his latest paper about the oral use of honey. And I'm like, look, I sent it to all of my oncologists at UGA and I said, would you guys mind reading this? Because to be honest, you know, like any dog would lap up like, you know, like a, a handful of honey. So it's a treat. It makes them happy. And, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You you buy an extra jar of honey. There is no bad side effect if you if you let your dog lick that honey. And the best case is maybe the tumor grows a little bit slower or, you know, it's like and there is some good evidence about that. So there is it's not just crazy talk. If they if they are looking at you like, what the hell are you talking about? Give them my email. I'm very happy. I have a folder with honey and cancer, venom and cancer. I'm sending them. I'm, I'm flooding them with good papers. If, if they don't want to do the literature research, I can I can do that for them. Thank you very much. Well, our local veterinarian is going to get a message from my wife tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and like I said, I mean, send them if they are like, dude, this is fringy. Uh, you know, send say I'm I'm more than willing to uh, have a have a discussion with them about the science behind it. I, actually, our guys are pretty interested in it already. Just having conversations while we were in there about them learning beekeeping, like while well, I've talked to them about it, and awesome, I think we've got them hooked that they're going to start. So. Passing Great. them on to you is the the logical next step. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to help no matter where you are. You know, I have a question. But, I'm from I'm Jennifer, and I'm from Carolina, and I have a question. When you're doing bee venom therapy, um, do y'all recommend taking certain vitamins and stuff? Um, no, I don't because I don't want to add another contributing factor, right? Because that's, I want to basically, my recommendation is to those people, uh, with their pets, don't change anything else. Let me be, let me be the only factor that is changing things right now versus, you know, you starting electrochemotherapy, multivitamin therapy, um, I, I don't, I don't, because that's going to muddy the water a little bit more, especially when we have a successful case and I want to publish it and the moment that I write. And at the same time, the owner started with mega dosing vitamin C, you know, then reviewer two is going to be like, how do you know it wasn't the mega dose of vitamin C that did it? I'm like, touche, right? So this is why I, I don't, um, because just, just to try to keep, the variables that we're introducing and the treatment to a minimum. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. I just had seen some videos on YouTube. I'm sure you've heard of, I think her name is Elliot or something, the bee bus. She travels around, talks about bee venom therapy, how oh, okay. she got Lyme disease and she's now cure, cured her. Wow. So. Maybe she's the same person in that in that YouTube in that in that Netflix commercial, because she was. I mean, you know, she she did a lot of PR work and stuff like this. So maybe she's traveling in a bus now. I don't remember her name. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Um, I wanted to ask, um, uh, and thank you so much for all this information and sharing your studies with us because it's totally fascinating, <laughs> oh. um, and gives a lot of hope to a lot of people. Um, but have you done any studies on dogs with degenerative myelopathy to see so, if it helps at all with their paralysis? Yeah. So see, I'm, I'm an exotic animal veterinarian. So don't ask me dog or cat question. I'm like, if, if something goes with my dogs and cats, you should see my D and the headlights look, I'm like, ah, uh, so, uh, so I, I don't, but like I said, when, when somebody asks me like, you know, like there is usually a paper somewhere squirreled away in the, in the, in the internet about, you know, uh, you know, potential diseases. So I don't know too much about dog and cat specific diseases because I don't treat them and my time is so limited that I have a hard time staying on top with my exotic pets. 
So, but what I would recommend is if you have a condition that has been perfectly diagnosed, go on, go on, go online and put in that name of that condition and put B venom on and see. And there is a, there is a fair chance that you that you find something or maybe a disease that is close related to has the same mechanism. This is where your veterinarian, if you have a veterinarian, that would embrace it. This is where they can probably help you with the scientific search. Well, well, it's not specifically that disease, but it's a you know, it's a neurodegenerative disease. And I found four other papers that also deal with neurodegenerative or whatever it is, immune mediated disease, right? So this is where a fruitful conversation can happen with a veterinarian that that knows something more about that disease specifically, and then is willing to help you um, explore that topic a little bit more. So what I'm hearing you say is I go in with a jar full of bees and say, um, so I saw these studies, here's these bees, where do I sting them? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's like the other thing is that, uh, you know, with dogs and cats, so what's really cool is there is actually tests available. There's professional labs where, and I usually recommend to do this because I do get quite a few emails about, hey, I have a cat with this horrible sarcoma on the nose. We can't take off, would you? I'm like, all right, here's the deal. First disclaimer, I don't do cats and and I know, obviously, that they sometimes are a little bit more sensitive, dogs and cats, to something like like a, 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 an antigen, an antigen exposure than my non-domesticated animals that I'm dealing with. But there is there is immune tests available where you can actually take a little bit of blood from a dog or a cat. You can submit it to a lab. And they can actually check if that animal has a, an exquisite sensitivity, if there's a likelihood for anaphylaxis to develop. Those tests have been usually verified for dogs, cats, and horses. Unfortunately, when we're dealing with guinea pigs or parrots or something like this, I can't run those tests because for these species, they're not verified. But if you're dealing with dogs and cats, they, you have you, your veterinarian can also test for that. It takes a little bit of blood. They submit that blood. They check off, check for bee venom. And like I said, if if you have a veterinarian that would be that would be interested, have them contact me. I can put them in contact with that company. They can request that test. They can submit it before you go ahead with your first bee sting because there is a paper in the in in uh, in the in published where a dog went into renal failure after bee stings. I don't know if those were 50 bee stings or only two bee stings, but like I said, they can develop anaphylaxis, but for dogs and cats, we can test for the likelihood of them developing it before. So that's what usually I would recommend. That that's the first step. If your veterinarian is willing to go down that road, do that test first. All right. Well, thank you so much. I will definitely be sharing that information with them because we're here in Georgia. So I know he, oh. I'm sure our vet would greatly appreciate all the information and knowledge that you yeah. have on everything have your vet have your vet email me um i i will get in touch with them i'm happy to talk in person on a cell phone with them so like i said i'm i'm happy to push the agenda and make sure that everybody's on the same page absolutely thank you so much my pleasure all right we're closing up on two hours here so I feel like we should probably let you get back to your normal life. That's um, all right. I got no life. <laughs> now, if, if anybody is, no, that's the thing. If anybody's, uh, you know, has a question, I'm happy to answer those. So I don't want to uh, shortchange anyone here. And we definitely owe you an apple pie. So <laughs> we'll have to figure out how to get that delivered over to you. That's all right. <laughs> You have to cool. come out past Dawsonville and we'll head over to the the uh, LJ Apple Orchards and get you sorted out. <laughs> Not All too right. far from you. Well, but... I guess nobody's piping up. So I guess, uh, again, thank you guys for listening to me for two hours. That's uh, You guys deserve a medal for that alone. <laughs> but thank you again very much. Like I've been looking forward to this one for a little while and just happy to be able to share the awesomeness that got to see at the Georgia conference with everybody here. So cool. thank you all again. Right. Thank you for getting it organized. It was my great pleasure to talk to all of you. And everybody's still here. Thank you for attending and thank you for everything you guys do for the organization.